All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to Climate Chat. I am your host, Dan Miller. And uh, today we're gonna be covering a paper from 2000 and uh, from August of, well, actually it was accepted in 2019. Oh, no, no, it's the wrong paper, sorry. I got two papers up here. Uh, accepted, I believe in August of 2022. Uh, and it's entitled, Climate Endgame, Exploring Catastrophic Climate Change Scenarios. And the lead author was Luke Kemp, and there were uh, three other authors. And uh, I thought it was a, it's an interesting topic to talk about because here on Climate Chat, we often talk about things that could happen that others are not necessarily talking about. I mean, maybe a, a good example of that would be the AMOC collapse or the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Ocean Conveyor Belt that might shut down around mid-century, causing havoc around the world. And this is not something that's covered by the IPCC uh, or by the media for the most part. Very, very little discussion about that. And that's a catastrophic potential outcome that's not being covered. And in this paper, they talk very broadly about how um, how catastrophic climate change uh, outcomes are not covered appropriately. So anyway, that's what the paper's about. And um, we're going to get, how about we get right into it. I want to uh, share the screen. Hold on a second here. Um, boop, 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 boop. Let's see if that works. Share. Now, and do you see uh, after there? after you've done that, if you can make Stacy a co-host, I can. Oh, okay, yeah, let's do that right now. Let's make Stacy a co-host. There we go. So because I, I appear to ha be having connectivity issues from time to time, so okay. So, uh, by the way, we have uh, uh, Eli and Stacy here as, as the co-hosts on this uh, call, and uh, we're going to, this is an open discussion meeting, so I'm going to be covering this paper and, and highlighting some of the key points, but if you have questions along the way or comments along the way, it's, it's okay to uh, raise your hand. The best way is on Zoom to raise your hand. Now, if you are in Clubhouse, um, you can... Uh, there's a link for Zoom at the top of the uh, room, and you can click on that to join the Zoom discussion. And you are welcome to join the Zoom discussion. Just please keep your camera and microphone off until you um, are asking a question um, or making a comment. If you are on YouTube Live and want to join the discussion beyond uh, comments uh, or questions in the comments, uh, you can go over to Clubhouse. If you're not a member, you can sign up, go uh, join the Climate Chat House, Climate Chat House, and uh, or you can look for me at uh, you know, uh, Dan Miller, which uh, on Clubhouse is at Dan Miller 999. And um, it, if you join the room, the link to the Zoom is in that room. So it's a little, we're doing that because otherwise, as we've, you know, we've been Zoom bombed here before by just posting it. So this is, you have to go through a hoop to get there, but uh, if you're willing to make the effort, you can join the conversation, ask questions and comment and things like that. So again, uh, if you're in Clubhouse, you are more than welcome to join the Zoom. Uh, and again, you can just, uh, you have a chance to ask questions and comment. Very good. So uh, and, and you should Stacey, see- just so, just so you know, Stacy, you're unmuted at the moment. Oh, oh okay. thank you. I didn't realize that. Well, hi, good morning, everyone, or good hi, day, Stacey. wherever people are. <laughs> so I, you should be seeing uh, the top, the title of the paper, Climate Endgame. Is that right? I'm going to just to yep, check. Yep, I see it on um, here and YouTube. So we're all set. Okay. So um, let's just jump right into it and, and talk about the, I'll just read the abstract because that summarizes the whole paper. Abstract, prudent risk management requires consideration of bad to worst case scenarios. Yet for climate change, such potential futures are poorly understood. Could anthropogenic climate change result in worldwide societal collapse or even eventual human extinction? At present, this is a dangerously unexplored topic. 
Yet there are ample reasons to suspect that climate change could result in a global catastrophe. Analyzing the mechanisms for these extreme consequences could help galvanize action, improve resilience, and inform policy, including emergency responses. We outline current knowledge about the likelihood of extreme climate change, discuss why understanding bad to worst cases is vital, articulate reasons for concern about catastrophic outcomes, define key terms, and put forward a research agenda. The proposed agenda covers four main questions. One, what is the potential for climate change to drive mass extinction events? Two, what are the mechanisms that could result in human mass mortality and morbidity? Three, what are human society's vulnerabilities to climate-triggered risk cascades, such as from conflict, political instability, and systemic financial risk? Four, how can these multiple strands of evidence, together with other global dangers, be usefully synthesized into an integrated catastrophic assessment? It's time for the scientific community to grapple with the challenge of better understanding catastrophic climate change. So that gives you uh, uh, an overview. And I think the key, you know, the, the one or two sentence highest level uh, of this paper is saying that the IPCC or the world in general has decided not to really focus on what could be the worst case outcomes and instead focus on one and a half degrees, two degrees of warming, because that's the goals that they have set. So they're trying to very understand as well as possible what are the risks of two degrees, for example. And even there, they're probably underplaying it. But but the thing is, just because we set a goal for two degrees doesn't mean we're going to stay at two degrees. And, and if we go over two degrees and hit three and four, um, and even at two degrees, there's chances that things won't be linear and that we're going to hit tipping points and risk cascades, which we'll talk about and things like that, that will make things far worse than we're planning on. And if, and, and at the very least, understanding the risk that you face will make you take action and do things that you wouldn't otherwise do if things are just going to be moderately bad. And, and a very, very simple example of this, if you play Russian roulette one time with one bullet in, the, in a six bullet chamber, you only have a one in six chance of blowing your brains out. So you can just say, well, that risk is low. You know, the, the majority of the time you're going to be fine doing that. And so if you ignored that one in six chance of blowing your brains out, you might actually consider playing that game. <laughs> but, but of course, you never should play that game. And you shouldn't let your children play that game. Um, because there are some really, really bad outcomes that happen with a reasonable probability, right? Same thing with climate change. There are, with very reasonable probabilities, maybe not over 50%, uh, but uh, maybe, maybe so, but maybe not. But even so, these are such bad outcomes that you know even considering them, we would normally take action to never even get close to those things. So, Yet so because- Dan... Yeah. The one thing I would say about that analogy, you know, I've heard you say it many times in it and it occurred to me, I'm like, okay, well, is that a fair analogy? Because Mm -hmm. you Russian roulette, you have the choice to play or not. Um, So it would have to be that something is on the line, you know, Mm -hmm. or if you don't play Russian roulette, your life will be hard and miserable. So do you want your or not? I shouldn't say hard and miserable. You will have to change so much about your life or. You can keep going, but you've got to play Russian roulette. You know that kind of thing. Well, I, I still think I, I still say it's a good analogy, even even in that context, because it it turns out we actually do have a choice. <laughs> it is totally our choice about what the future is. We've just right, we're right, just but, taking the lazy the lazy approach and saying, yeah, I, you know, there has to. I'm saying I there still has want to, to go to I'm, Europe, and I don't, you know, I don't want to like feel guilty about flying or. Exactly. I don't want to mess things there up. There has to the... be something on the line. And right now it's a play Russian roulette or not. So you have to have something on the other side of the Russian roulette. Why anyone would step up and play it at all, you know? 
Um, well, but, okay. I mean, right I, that's now. fair, but I still think that. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm saying it's when just you're like considering it. the the point is if you're considering doing anything, and there's an unbelievably high risk of total catastrophe at any reasonable probability in all other walks of life, whether it's flying in an airplane or, or, or I don't know, sending your kids to cross the street or whatever it might be. Um, we always, well, almost always take into account the extreme risk you know, thing and, and mitigate that. We said, well, let's not do that. Let's, uh, you know, let's on airplanes, we do everything to make it safe that we possibly can. And um, yet in this particular case, when we're talking about the entire planet and the entire human population, and by the way, the population of all the other animals and plants and things like that too, for some reason, we almost totally ignore the uh, the tail risk, it's called the tail risk, uh, uh, which are catastrophic tail risk. And we One just ignore six it. is not a tail risk. Say again? One in six is not a tail risk, right? That's, that's well. That's I mean, risk. depends how you look at it, but yeah. I, I actually, with our with the plane analogy, I would I would go to the other plane analogy, which is I remember a time. Everybody on this call does, I'm sure, when you could go to the airport and go directly to your gate, and whoever drove you could go to your gate, and whoever was picking you up could come to your gate. And instead of waiting in a in a labyrinth, you know, or going through some gauntlet to get on the plane security wise. Well, you have to be like, like over one, 30 to remember that. <laughs> 2001. One, one thing, well, everyone I see, I believe, is over 30. So <laughs> but if you if you now we, you know, we had this one incident that was large, I guess, but it it changed everything. It changed everything about how we do that, but it only changed everything for the people that do that. Now we have something that is changing no matter who's playing, no matter who's flying, it is the entire world is is victims and we do nothing. We yeah, change yeah. Well, nothing. Well, that, well, that's kind of the point here. Yeah. And then I could also point out that yeah, even though like several thousand people died in 9-11, uh, 8 million people are dying every year from the burning of fossil fuels. It's not even on the news at all. It's not even discussed. So, yeah. um, yeah, so there's so there's and we've talked a lot about that, the psychological side of climate change and how it's hard for us to engage on it. This paper is saying, wait a second, we actually do know something about catastrophic climate risk we don't know enough certainly and that's the whole point of this paper is that they're calling for more research but there is some research already and and for human reasons not scientific reasons which we'll talk about a little bit we aren't facing this and if we did face it it would actually help in many ways and we'll talk about that i mean it would spur action it would have you know there would be more reduction there would be faster reduction in emissions for example but because you know there, there's optimism bias a lot of other things uh we don't take into account the catastrophic side of it we get away with ignoring climate change more than we we certainly should but, you know, a, but let's, a, a couple yeah. of different analogies i mean so so if, if we're going to go stick with russian roulette it's you know somebody is coming up and, and spinning the 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 revolver and pointing it at your kid's head because they want to continue with their comforts and make sure that their stock portfolio portfolio does really well right that's that's for a lot of people <laughs> they're they're not making the decisions and they're not on on the beneficiary end they're on the the you know experience the damage end uh of things and and less damage than having their kids brains blown out but still you know their lives are being disrupted in many cases but then you know uh, 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 taking that a uh, uh, step further if we ever detected any country that you know we we've been having uh disputes with uh doing something to create even a fraction of the risks that were that we're building in really to to our you know it's in the pipeline right um uh we we, we would go to war we there okay. would be 
little question that we would just, you know, quickly go to war and stop them. Okay. Well, let's jump jump into the paper. Uh, it starts off with how, how, how bad could how bad could climate change get? Um, as they say in this uh, 19, 1988 landmark Toronto conference uh, on climate, they, they said climate change is potentially second only to a global nuclear war in terms of the ultimate consequences of what it could cause. So that, starting off with that, and um, as they say, the potential for catastrophic climate impacts depends on the magnitude and rate of climate change, as we covered recently with the Hansen paper, the rate of climate change is actually 50 to 100 percent more than it was, uh, you know, 20 years ago, and uh, be, because of aerosols and other things. So, you know, so it is extremely. I mean, compared to the natural rates of the past, it's it's a hundred times faster than what we've seen in the past. So that makes it even even worse. Um, and then there's a potential for what's called cascading risk. So you have one risk that impacts one thing, but that then impacts your ability to recover from another thing or, or whatever. And like if a hurricane uh, knocks out all your power and then you have a heat wave, well, now you don't have air conditioning and then many people die from the heat exposure. So that would be a cascading risk. And these are under examined. There, and uh, they, they did a text analysis of the IPCC reports and found out there there's really not much focus on things above three degrees, even though there's very high probability we'll go over three degrees. And uh, and and because they set the goals for two and one point five, that's where it, it's uh, uh, you know focused on. Um, so there's also compound hazards I mentioned there. The cyclone just uh, destroys electrical infrastructure, leaving a population vulnerable to deadly heat wave. And we've also seen compound hazards because of COVID-19 that affected a lot of other things, for example. Um, so why? So the question is, why did they focus? Why are we focusing on the lower temperatures and not the higher temperatures? So they're saying here in the paper, one reason is the benchmark, the Paris Agreement, the goal is you know, warming well below two degrees with an aspiration for 1.5, which we're at this year, of course. Uh, and they said another reason is is the cultural uh, the, the scientists want to err on the side of least drama, not to be seen as alarmists. And then you get this uh, other uh, you get um, the IPCC process, which is this consensus process, and that further uh, elim eliminates the focus on uh, catastrophic risk. And there also the other reason is that. Uh, it's more difficult to do uh, a catastrophic risk assessment than it is just to do one at uh, yeah one point five or two because it's just a little bit away from where we're at, so it's easier to do. But if, uh, if as you get into higher temperatures or into tipping points, then it's harder to do, and so yeah, you know, people kind of do the easier things. Um, you also prefer to talk talk about predictions that you have a sixty six percent chance of getting right than you know a ninety nine percent chance of being wrong, even though it's really important that people understand the one percent risk. Right. And there's a paper called uh, that Jim Hansen wrote a long time ago called Scientific Res Reticence and Sea Level Rise. And this is why are all these scientists um underestimating sea level rise? They're talking about one to two to one to two feet by the end of the century when it could be three, four, five, ten feet. At the end of the century why is the focus on such and he looked at it and basically what uh, eli was saying if you're writing a paper you're 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 an, uh, a professor and you're going to write a paper uh so two things can happen you could write the paper i mean you could write the paper and you're right everything's fine but if you write the paper and you're wrong it really hurts your uh, your scientific reputation so you really want to avoid writing papers that turn out to be wrong so what you do is you focus on being writing about things you're very sure are correct, and usually two sigma or 95% chance that you're right. And so when you say sea level may be X, you know, you're going to say, well, you're 95% sure it's going to be three feet, but you're only 25% sure that it's going to be nine feet. You're going to write about three feet. You're not going to write about nine feet 
But 25% chance would be nine feet is like unbelievable probability for an incredibly uh, you know, awful thing. So you should be writing about that. But again, for your scientific reputation, you don't do that. So if you don't write about nine feet and it turns out to be true, you haven't hurt your reputation because you never wrote about it. And so this, again, this is not a big deal if you're talking about black holes or, you know, things like that or the speed of light. But if you're talking about our climate that we live in, you know, if, if the military worked this way, we would lose every war we ever fought. I mean, you know, like they always take into account the the chance that the, 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 the troops on the other side are more than they think, that they have better weapons. You always plan for the worst case, and that's how you win. If you just plan for the average case, you're, always, you're going to almost always lose. And that's what we're doing with climate. There's again, there's no reason for us to do this. I mean, it's scary to look at the worst case, and that will get some people upset. But it, it, but it's just the reality that there are these chances that these very bad things can happen. And again, the point is not just to do it to scare people, but when if you're going to do a proper risk assessment, if you're going to set, for example, the social cost of carbon, or you think of it, the, the carbon tax fee, you should build into that fee or uh, the assessment, the the total risk, not just the risk up to a certain warming and then ignoring all the risk after that. So that's, that's why this is really important. So worst case climate change, let me see if I can get up to here. Um, so they've been looking at this for 30 years. Uh, they were on track to 3.9 degrees by 2100. And then if everyone followed the Paris Agreement, agreement which they are not, <laughs> then we would be able to limit warming to 2.4. Um, and then if they actually uh, meet all the long-term pledges, uh, we could be, keep under 2.1. And you very often hear, oh, under the Paris Agreement, we're going to limit warming to 2.1 degrees. That's not true at all. These are just Pledges that were made that are not being followed up on, they're not doing, you know, you need to reduce, um, you need to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030 uh, to, to meet these pledges. We're not, we're not doing that. So even then, I mean, it's, it's I mean, there's one thing to, to follow the best case, but you're not, we're not even doing the best case. So there's all of that. So temperatures of more than two degrees above pre-industrial values have not been sustained on Earth's surface since before the Pleistocene epoch, more than 2.6 million years ago. So we're we're heading for sure past that, unless of course we do geoengineering. But uh, but again, we're just blindly going forth without actually looking at. I don't know. It's like putting a blindfold on and crossing a, a freeway or something, you know, <laughs> and maybe there's not, you say, Hey, but there's not a lot of cars on the freeway. Well, I don't really care. You're crossing blindfolded. I would suggest, you know, you might want to peek under the blindfold there. Um, and, and they also say that even if we actually do reduce our emissions starting soon, which we're not doing, but if we, even if we did that, that doesn't rule out that we might still see very high greenhouse gas concentrations because there are feedbacks in the climate carbon cycle. Just one simple example is uh, as the Arctic warms, it melts the permafrost. The permafrost holds twice as much carbon as the entire atmosphere holds. So even a small amount of, of melting, you know, five, 10 percent of that is a huge amount of greenhouse gases. And, and a lot of that could come out as methane instead of CO2. And that makes it even worse. And that's just one feedback, and there are others. And there's also tipping points. That, that actually happens to be a tipping point if it really starts to run away. We can't stop the permafrost melt. That would be a tipping point because it would just start putting CO2 into the atmosphere faster than we can reduce our own CO2. Uh, there's others, the AMOC collapse, um, uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the collapse of the Amazon rainforest, many, many tipping points that... And as they talk about in this paper, um, where it used to be, they these were th seen as far away in temperature. Like, you know, you had to get above three to tip these things. We now know that they could tip somewhere between one and three, you know, so around two. And we're headed for two in like 15 years. So um, 
that's why we have to take these things into account and start studying them. Uh, again, the point of the paper, study the catastrophic risks so that you can inform policy and, and, and galvanize action and do other very positive things. So there are very positive outcomes to assessing the catastrophic risk that we face. Someone was just speaking. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention there's that paper that uh, uh, you know came out that said in 2020, we actually crossed the point at which uh, uh, zero emissions won't uh, prevent self-sustained permafrost thaw. Right. So that's right. an example right. of, you know, it's 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 not rapid because this is this is a gradual process. But we're we're already at a point where where we could we could just stop emitting everything and uh, cha climate change would continue to get worse. Yeah. And here's another point, by the way, which is actually important to think about. We think of things getting worse as things heat up. And, yeah, OK, that's true. But there's also the concept that things are okay until they're not, that we cross a threshold and then all of a sudden it's not okay anymore. And they talk about the permafrost I mentioned. They also talk about a uh, carbon loss due to intense droughts and fires in the Amazon and the apparent slowing of dampening feedback, such as the natural carbon sink capacity, like the, the ability of the ocean, for example, to absorb CO2 or the, the uh, forest. Uh, you know, the, when, when you have forests that have so many forest fires, they give off more CO2 than they absorb by growing trees. And that's where you've, you've flipped. Um, and instead, these are not likely to be proportional to warming, as is sometimes assumed. Instead, abrupt and or irreversible changes may be triggered at a temperature threshold. Such changes are evident in Earth's geological record and their impacts cascaded across the coupled climate, ecological, social system. Particularly wearing is a tipping cascade in which multiple tipping elements interact in such a way that tipping one, uh, that tipping one threshold increases the likelihood of tipping another. You know, for example, if the permafrost does, you know, release a lot of, of CO2, then that makes the earth warmer and then it could make sea level rise accelerate, which could do other things. That, that's that example. Yeah, Eric, uh, Eric, welcome. Eric, you got, you can unmute. Yeah, sorry. I, I stepped go. away from, uh, yeah. So what occurs to me based on the, uh, the fascinating thing that happened a couple of years ago in, um, um, in, um, uh, where they were able to predict horrible forest fires in uh, Australia. Um, like the understanding of when climate change will be kind of undeniable um, and um, like convincing to the average Republican voter. Like what, <laughs> like, because isn't that like the most, the most, one of the more interesting things about impending disasters is how does it shift like the politics in a country like the U.S.? So any thoughts you have about that? Does this paper? Well, that, I mean, that's a, that at all? We, we've talked about that. This paper is, it's a little different. It's saying, look, we're not talking about this stuff at all, really. I mean, you know, there's a little bit, but, but really not enough, not appropriate for the risk that we're facing. Once we do that, it will help across the board somewhat with those Republican voters, although you could argue maybe not since they kind of believe they don't really believe in reality to start with very often, but you know, okay. Uh, but forget that. How about the mainstream voters? How about not the, the extreme voters? You know, we, we know that 70% or 60, 70% of people believe in climate change are concerned about climate change. And the vast, vast majority of them do nothing about climate change. They don't talk about it. They don't vote about it. They don't, you know, but if they actually understood the, really crazy serious risks that we face i think a lot more of them would be um uh, engaged you know talk about oh did you hear that this could do by this year i mean by 2050 this could happen you know the, the scare you know i guess I if you're not scared more. you're you're not paying attention i mean you know, and like if you thing. can tell people like um I, you know that something is very very likely that like there was an amazing coup right where they're able to predict massive unbelievable forest fires and then they happened right and like that's well uh, it turns out that that doesn't help too much because all this has been predicted everything is happening has been predicted 
uh, you know, not, not the particular place and time, but the fact that there would be more droughts, more floods, more fires, all this. By the way, Jim Hansen had this in his 1981 <laughs> Science Magazine article on climate. That, that he laid it all. He said the he said the Northwest Passage would open, which it has. He said we'll be able to tell climate change has increased warming by the end of the century, which was you know 2000, and indeed, yep, and this was 1980s. Where you know the the climate signal was still in the noise to some degree, as he put it, and so everything he laid out, and what you know, certainly the the deniers just say he was all wrong about everything, when it was just not true. He was right, but you know, so so even having that doesn't help with them anyway, right? And <laughs> it didn't really help with the public either. I mean, you know, so this was all predicted. So I think what's uh, what will happen, though, so this is a little different in that a lot of those predictions were generic, like, oh, well, you know, it's going to be more floods and fires and heat. But no one really understood viscerally what that meant. But if you can look at these catastrophes and say, you know, there's going to be massive famine <laughs> because of food systems collapsing, which is really, by the way, one of the biggest risks we face in the relatively near term. Um that might get more attention because we're, by the way, we're starting to see the impacts of that, right? There's a Ukraine war that certainly impacts food supply because of that. But in the past, other parts of the world would make up for it. There's always like an interruption, you know, every few years in one of the major bread baskets of the world, but then the other ones are coming along and they do their thing. But this time, um, you know, in India and everywhere, there's having too much water, too little water, to, to extreme hot temperatures, and everything that impacts crops. And therefore, we're starting, you know, we're seeing food shortages, which also leads to political instability almost every time that happens. And uh, so we're starting to see it, but we haven't seen anything yet, I mean, compared to what it will be. And so be, alerting people to that, I think is, again, I totally agree with this paper in that we should be doing this assessment. Again, it's not ringing the bell. We're all going to die. <laughs> In fact, the guy who posted this, uh, the, one of the authors, he, I guess, reposted it on Twitter. He said, we are not saying everyone's going to die. <laughs> That's like the, step one. That's the very first thing he said. This paper does not say everyone's going to die. It's saying there are big risks. We should be studying them. And there's big benefits to studying them. If, if you have to say nothing else, that's the, you know, the summary of this paper. Well, and but the, the, the thing is, make... you like go, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, I, I mean it's it's implied, but it it still needs to be underlined. You know, we need to study it. Uh, we also need to to you know <laughs> have strategies and be ready to implement them and get them to scale uh, to do things. And that's where we're we're really just you know everybody's still talking about reducing fossil fuel emissions, right? And it's it's that's not the operative uh, solution that we need if any of this uh, uh, comes to pass. Okay, uh, well, well, finish well, I, I, the point. Wait, I, the only I thing... think maybe the more to the point that, that I was trying to say. I think they did an amazing good PR job in Australia because they predicted this particular season, like the particular season was yeah. going to be a horrible forest fire season, and they, they got a, because they a good amount of press yeah. Yeah. predicting yeah. it. And then when it came true, I'm wondering if the kind of analysis here can help us with any of that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm not sure they're even saying uh, that near term. They're, they're actually not. I think they're, the focus is on what can happen 10, 20, 30, 50 years, even 100 years from now. And uh, but you know, the better we get at predict. I mean, you can do some prediction with you know a strong El Nino is coming. You could look at the last strong El Nino and say, ah, last time in Australia we had a lot of fires with the big El Nino. So I think that's what was happening there. It was a little different than what this paper is covering. Hey, Brian, uh, had, we are predicting it now. Um, they're saying for this year here in Australia that it it's like 70, 80 percent chance of being much drier than normal and mm -hmm. drought will correspond to, I mean, we ha already have the heat. Uh, and so the wildfire incidence has been going up. We've had two regional wildfires already, and we just hit the first day of summer this week uh, with December 1st. And did so you have like a lot of um, huge fires in the north 
the west, like an un unpopulated area in the northwest, north of and Perth, around Perth as well. You had uh, yeah, there are crazy, some. crazy the fires part, already. Yeah. Yeah. And the southeast has seen, I mean, five years ago, that was the site of some of the worst fires, unprecedented really. Um, right. I did also want to touch on uh, something you said, a quick example in the ocean's ability to absorb carbon is largely determined or limited by algae production. And we know the supply of macronutrients for algae production has dropped 20 to 40% in the subtropical and tropical oceans during to, due to a warm capping layer in the, in the ocean, increasing the energy barrier to natural upwelling. So less upwelling means less nutrients, less nutrients means less algae, and less algae means less carbon dioxide fixation, less marine snow to the deep sea. The biological pump is actually unraveling in the tropical and subtropical oceans on a strategic 60-year time scale. Um, yeah, but also, I mean, ocean ability to uptake also has to do with uh, the temperature of the ocean, right? The ability to just like, you know, a warm Coke doesn't have as much fizz as a cold Coke does. I mean, there's that aspect of it. And other things, the ocean circulations of bringing the CO2 into lower depths leaves it fresher to absorb more CO2 at the upper depths. If you stratify the ocean and it doesn't sink down, then it's going to get saturated with CO2 at the upper level and won't take in as much. So there's a lot of factors there that that, that go into that. So that There cool. are. Uh, that said, the biological pump is demonstrated to be uh, the perhaps largest uh, carbon sink uh, in the in the marine space of um, several gigatons per year. And uh, seeing it uh, unravel, I mean, that marine snow is responsible for the distribution of carbon throughout the ocean, presently around 38,000 gigatons of carbon in the ocean. And thus it rep represents a really vast carbon sink. And to see it uh, operating less well presents a very uh, serious concern given the 20 or 30 percent of carbon that has been absorbed in the past two centuries by the ocean and largely uh, sequestered using biological the biological pump in the ocean yeah. okay um by the way speaking of other uh, that, that's one possible area to look at and they also talk about this paper uh, in particular poorly understood cloud feedbacks might trigger sudden and irreversible global warming. Such effects remain underexplored and largely speculative, unknown, un, well, largely speculative, unknown unknowns that are still being discovered. For instance, recent simulations suggest that stratocumulus cloud decks might abruptly be lost at CO2 concentrations that could be approached by the end of this century, causing an additional 8C of global warming. Wow. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Large fact, uncertainties been... about dangerous surprises are reasons to prioritize them rather than neglect them. I'm going to emphasize that again because one of the big issues in climate change is that the deniers bring up uncertainties all the time. We don't know about that. Hey, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. That's true. And other people hear about uncertainties and then they say, well, we don't know, so I'm not going to think about it. Uncertainty is not your friend. <laughs> Uncertainty means you must act even more aggressively to find out what it is or prepare for the worst. And, and, it's the, and we do the opposite. We use uncertainty to disengage from the subject when, I mean, again, back to the Russian roulette, um, Let's say you had a, you know, you, you decided for some reason you wanted to play. I mean, there's only one bullet in the chamber. Now, what if I told you, well, actually, there's an unknown number of bullets in the chamber. It's uncertain how many bullets are in the chamber. Does that mean, oh, it's uncertain. I'm just going to go play. <laughs> no, you're not going to just go play. You're going to go, whoa, what? You mean there might be five bullets in the chamber? It could be, it could be six. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to pass. <laughs> yeah, in fact, um, it's not so uncertain. The last 20 or 25 years, has the, the NASA series satellite, um, CERES, has actually measured the decrease in marine cloud cover uh, in these regions uh, with a warmer world. Uh, we've actually seen on the order of this uh, one watt per square meter of additional forcing, partly aerosols and partly there are aerosols given off by algae 
that contributes significantly to those stratocumulus clouds. And so this is a known, this is being observed now. Uh, Professor Tapio Schneider at Caltech has been validating in simulations that, in fact, a warmer world is a less cloudy world. And of course, very small changes in cloud cover are having profound effects on radiative balance. Right. And we're seeing mm -hmm. changes in cloud cover due to the shipping, mm -hmm. the redu mm -hmm. reduction in shipping aerosols. Mm -hmm. uh, JP, you got to mm -hmm. mute there. Okay. Got you muted there. Okay. Agreed. Just, to see um, it. Just a, a really quick point. The, the, the biogenic aerosols, some of them, uh, when the temperature gets be it past a certain point, the, the organisms that produce them just can't anymore. Um, and uh, that that is, you know, not one of these gradual responses. This could be a drastic step function. How extensive mm -hmm. that is, is an unknown unknown or is a known unknown, I should say. OK, so let's uh, get back to some of the paper here again. And they talk about the things that we don't know or that we should know more about. One of them is the equilibrium climate sensitivity. This is like how much the world warms in the relatively short term to a doubling of CO2, which we have actually accomplished now. Not We've increased CO2 by 50%, but when you throw in methane and the other greenhouse gases, we have doubled the effective CO2 forcing. And, um, and the IPCC says it's from 2.5 to four is the likely range, but there's a chance it's even higher. And then of course, along comes Jim Hansen recently and says, well, actually it's 4.8 because we now studied the ice ages better and we know there was more warming in the ice age than we previously thought. And since we know how much CO2 changed in the last ice age, that kind of tells us what the sensitivity to a doubling of CO2 is. And they did, did the math and it turns out to be 4.8 plus or minus 1.2, I think it was. So you add in plus 1.2, <laughs> you're now at six, right? Which is you know, absolutely crazy. So, um, and again, you should be, do you go plus or minus? Okay, let's just say everyone agrees for some reason it's 4.8 plus or minus 1.2. Some people say, well, it might actually only be 3.6 because you know you, you subtract the 1.2, you get the bottom of the error bar. Okay, but you can also add 1.2 and get six. And so, you know, you should be assuming the six. You, I mean, it's great if it ends up being, you know, 3.6, but your planning you, and the stuff you do should mitigate against the six happening. So that's kind of the point of all of this. Um, they also talk about the different scenarios, the emission scenarios, eight, uh, RCP 8.5, which matches the emissions we've had so far. And But people say, well, we're going to cut our emissions in the future. But a number of things there, there uh, maybe we're going to have a lot of economic growth. And even though the emissions per person goes down, the total emissions still go up. That could keep us closer. And even though the emissions might not track RCP 8.5, the forcing or the uh, the amount of energy coming in versus going out in the Earth system uh, seems to be matching the 8.5 scenario, even if the emissions don't. Um, and that's partly because of aerosols, as we talked about earlier. So why, okay, why should we explore climate catastrophe? Let me see if I can find this. There we go. This section here, I'm reading from my notes here, so not from the paper. Why explore climate catastrophe? Well, the first thing is that if you're gonna do risk management, you need to have a knowledge of what the extremes are. It kind of makes sense, right? You're trying to, you're trying to prepare for risk. You wanna know how bad things could get. Pretty, pretty simple there. And also it has major implications for economic analysis, modeling, and society's responses. And this gets factored into what's called the social cost of carbon or how much, what's the value of uh, removing a ton of CO2. Um, and then very importantly, knowing the worst cases can compel action. And uh, that has been seen. They talked about the, when the idea of a nuclear winter came out and they said, look, if we have a nuclear war, everybody dies, <laughs> not just the people you bomb. But everyone on Earth dies from a nuclear winter, or at least maybe not dies, but you know it's a catastrophe for 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 you, the country that launched the attack, as well as the country that received the attack. Even if they don't have a chance to retaliate, you're still screwed. And when that was revealed, there was also more impetus to do something about preventing nuclear uh, nuclear exchange, because when you think you're going to win, 
then you're much more likely to do it. But when you know it's a it's a lose lose, um, there there's, can be more action. And same is true for climate change. So um, okay, so that so uh, the uh, other uh, so knowing that the worst case can compel action, and that I think is a super super important one. And it also says understanding catastrophic climate scenarios can also inform policy interventions, including last resort emergency measures like solar radiation management or sunlight reflection methods, as we like to call it. And um, they, they talk a little bit about SRM in here. They seem to see it as an extremely risky move. Uh, it certainly is risky. But again, uh, and the whole point of this discussion is that you have to look at those risks versus the risks of not doing it. And if you ignore the extreme cases of what happens, it, it makes it, you, you you view the not doing it approach as being less, you know, less of a problem, right? Eh, well, it'll get warmer, you know, whatever, but, you know, we haven't really looked at it, but society will be fine. Well, no, look, look at this. There's an X percent chance that society collapses under these scenarios. And it's not just, by the way, it's important to emphasize, and they try to emphasize it in this paper, it's not just because a single thing will be worse than we thought, like the temperature will be higher, and so therefore there'll be more drought, but it will be systemic. The, the higher temperatures will release more permafrost greenhouse gases, which will uh, accelerate the collapse of the Amazon, which will release even more and absorb less CO2. And, 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 and it's like a tipping cascade of events where and perhaps any single event, maybe you could have dealt with, but you can't deal with the onslaught of them and the collapse of the food system while the sea level's rising and while there's the raging fires and while all these other things. So the government's ability to handle things will diminish and maybe disappear. And when that happens, then you can have collapse of the government. And, you know, people think, well, that could never happen, but it actually happens all the time. But look at Somalia and there's something called the fragile states index, which they talk about in this, uh, in this uh, paper that's list, um, you know, which states are teetering on the, on their governments to sort of remain intact and functioning. And an interesting story about that is I gave a climate talk to the um, Fund for Peace, the folks who did this report called the Fragile States, which used to be called back then the Failed States Index. But when it's called the Failed States Index, every country did not want to be on the list, not even listed as failed, but even, you know, anything less than 100% uh, good, you know, they wanted didn't want to be associated with failed, so they changed the name to Fragile State Index, which was, I guess, a smart political move. But then, so I gave them a talk on climate. This was quite a long time, at least ten years ago, and uh, told them how bad things could get and everything like that. And then we had a discussion afterwards, and it turns out that their failed states index at the time, and even the current Fragile State Index, does not take climate change into account, which is to me mind boggling because that's like the number one thing that's going to contribute to failed or fragile states, collapse of governments. I mean, so anyway, that, that was just kind of blew my mind. Back then it blew my mind 10 years ago. And I went, I went to look it up uh, a few weeks ago to see what their criteria is today for fragile states. And they didn't list climate change as one of them. So Brian, what, one one quick thing that's to just emphasize. like the oh, okay. that's just like the uh, economists taking into account the temperature, but not the rainfall change that occurs <laughs> in a climate disrupted world when calculating famine. It's just you know green side up. It's just crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll I'll tell you the the other. What is the really the major? point of this article that let's even take it a step higher than what we've talked about yet i think people in general want to assume that if there's a serious problem then the people in charge are looking at it and taking steps to address it that is not a safe assumption at all 
That is not a safe assumption. And that's what, in a sense, what this paper is saying. You think the IPCC who's in charge of looking at the science of climate change and reporting to policymakers and making recommendations. They are ignoring these catastrophic outcomes for a whole bunch of social and psychological reasons, not for scientific reasons. And if they didn't do that, then they would have to, you know, call for stronger action. And it would be more difficult, even though I'm sure they'd still figure out a way to ignore it, but the policymakers would, you know, have more pressure on them to act. So don't assume that just because climate change is a huge problem. I mean, don't assume, for example, that the Biden administration is doing anything serious to address climate change. I mean, they did do the Inflation Reduction Act, which you know promotes renewables. It's, it's great, it's wonderful stuff. But but they're still approving oil leases, and you you can't do that if you're serious about climate change. Yeah, Brian. There's an area of academic work that does a good job of this, and that is actuarial estimates of risk. And I wonder, maybe we need to get the reinsurance business involved in these discussions to really have re, you know, reasonable, quantifiable risk assessments of these scenarios. That's their business, after all. It is, although I think they don't really have to face it to the extent this paper is talking about, because they can they can decide every year to uh, renew your insurance and this is what's happening in florida is you know the last hurricane okay we're going to raise everybody's rates by 40 percent you know some crazy number and uh and then you can decide to go or not and then of course many insurance companies just decide well we're leaving we're we're leaving the state it's too risky here and so it in other words they have some outs that means they don't actually have to face the long-term catastrophic risk, right? Mm -hmm. They face, they certainly do a decent job of looking at shorter term catastrophic risk. And, and that's, that kind of catastrophic is not the same catastrophic risk, right? That's, that's a big hurricane destroyed like a whole city, whatever. And that costs billions of dollars versus the government collapses and people, you know, and, or, or there's mass starvation. That they're not looking at those kinds of risks, but um, and yeah. then and, and just on that insurance thing, when all the insurance companies leave, then the state has to step in to provide insurance, right? Because you can't own a home, you can't get a loan from a bank unless you have insurance. So if you can't get, if there's no insurance companies, no one can buy a home, and you know that causes big problems. So Florida stepped in, and they have their own state insurance fund, which is still expensive. But someone pointed out that. If the last hurricane was fully insured by the state, it would not only bust the uh, insurance budget, it would bust the entire state's total budget. Like, I think it was $100 billion. Like, that was the entire budget for the state. And that's how much that catastrophe cut. Now, it turned out it was covered both by private insurance, by the state insurance, and by no insurance. In other words, people just lost what they lost. And no one had to pay them because they didn't have insurance. Um, but if the state had insured it fully, then and that just shows the danger of you can't. I mean, the state can just say whatever they want. They go, oh yeah, we'll insure everybody, but that doesn't mean they can actually afford it, right? So there's anyway. And, um, and these, these are these are not tail risks. These are risks that are being realized, right? These these are that's right. These are not the that's why my point. Risks. Yeah, this is this is the real. So the insurance companies are looking at the practical risk going forward, which is more than what people think. And they're doing a good job of saying, yeah, you know, in the next few years, even, you know, we could have a hurricane, could destroy everything, uh, flooding, for example, whatever. So it's it's not really the same as what this paper is calling for. Um, yeah. and, and so going know. back to, to SRM, uh, just one point that needs to be emphasized about it, even though it is not, you know, we always have to say this, it's not a complete solution. Getting excess carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere is absolutely essential, uh, you know, as, as the end game of preserving uh, a planet that resembles the one that humans evolved in and, and the ecology that we know thrives in. And... Uh, uh, the thing is, though, that that, you know, to avoid these tail risks, we're going to need to do uh, something very different. Uh, SRM is, is probably the most powerful uh, tool we could use if, if we would start thinking about it more. Uh, but the other very important thing about SRM is that 
it, it, it is fast acting. And depending on, on how you do it and how extensively you do it, it can, uh, it can actually reduce these, these ongo- these unfolding risks in the near term. And, and reduce the number of extreme weather events and, and, and all of the other problems that we run into, uh, even at the level of warming that we're experiencing now. Okay. And by the way, let me just say to people in the Clubhouse or YouTube Live, um, if you have questions or if you have questions, um, you can post them in the comments and we'll we'll check back. I just quickly did a check. There's discussions going on, but I didn't see particular questions for, for the folks in the Zoom meeting, but um or for myself. But if you do have that, you know, now's a good time and we'll go back and check in a little bit and see if you have particular questions you want us to address. Um so we can all participate here. Um well, one one thing. That that occurred to me, um, I think it's when Eric was talking about like, well, what makes this more palatable? What makes things want to people want to act, especially those who don't believe and which is increasingly um, falls along party lines. And I was like, who could get people who could could sort of galvanize everyone who could probably. And I was like, oh, and it goes to my. Um. It, if unless the military gets involved, unless we take this as seriously as it is a war um, and we tap into those hefty budgets that we have, especially here in the U.S., Colin Powell, if we could bring Colin Powell back, oh, I would vote for him in a minute if he was on this team because he, he dead? is someone. Isn't he, didn't he, he, yeah, die? he died? Yeah, he died. 2021. Yeah. yeah. If oh, we yeah, could, yeah. if somehow reanimate well him. yeah but he's also known for lying about uh you know, he lost a lot of credibility when he proposed us invading iraq and it was all false and he kind of knew it or should have known it was false and so i don't know he lost some but he, if you he, want to everyone's stack, flawed right? I mean, but <laughs> schwarzenegger can't run uh, he's somebody who could do it he can't be president of the u.s and so it's like who are we left with on that side who has the has credibility with them Because that's the biggest thing is getting the people who don't want to change or don't want to move, don't want to take this seriously. How do we get them to do it? And that to me is the is we need somebody on that side. And there is no one within their ranks that I can see that is able to even give. um, Well, well, I mean, I don't know. We we, we could be talking about IP. We could be talking about the COP28 today that's going on. And, you know, the, the whole thing. There, I mean, and what we talked about last week, really, which was appropriate for COP28, is that the people in charge of fixing climate change are the top 1% of emitters who have no interest in changing <laughs> their lifestyles. Oh, and, and the, uh, the yeah. dude, the, the dude, you know, who was caught with his hand in the cookie jar and the whole thing, he came out and said, you know, it's like, I don't even know if you can say quiet part out loud. Like he said, basically, Ooh. there is the the. The shake guy. Who oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that he was trying to promote oil deals while he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but but the thing that I that I last saw was something to the effect of there is no science that says that um, that eliminating fossil fuels is going to fix this. Here, I should. Here, we can vary it up. Hi. Is, yeah. is that what there's he said? No, <laughs> there's no science that says that eliminating fo- fossil fuels, and I think he's basically saying alone, will fix this. So it is. Oh, okay, uh, sure. That's it is. Fine, and, but... and, and yeah, sure, sure. Fine, fine, fine. Mm-hmm. But it's like no one is saying that, that that's the case. So he's basically saying if it's not going to fix everything, then why do it? You know? Um, and By the way, I, I just think the idea that the CEO... You know, of a major oil company is the head of the president of the cop meeting is so absurd that if anyone wrote a script for that so it onion. would be rejected as totally well, come on guys it's like okay it's uh, it's an onion article sure you could do it as an onion article but we don't do onion articles here so now nah, that's ridiculous so forget it and, and but forget i mean to forget that he is the president the idea that the people who selected him could even conceive of selecting him, let alone oh, actually oh, oh. doing it, the fact they could conceive of it 
I, I think the only the only thing that they could have been doing is sort of what I'm saying. This: How do we get them to come along? How do we get them to? Sure, realize? sure. That's 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 the key. But, uh, but we haven't figured that out yet. But... Them saying that they weren't they weren't. I, I think the thing that's going to make it happen. But first of all, I think this paper I think is pointing out something. There, there's two things. Uh, as far you know, again, I've been doing this like for 20 years, and you know, no one was listening to me or the other people. There weren't a lot, but there were certainly a lot of. Well, there were a bunch of people sounding the alarm. Jim Hansen, I mean, is maybe the you know, best example. Um, uh, since he testified to Congress, we've we've increased uh, emissions by sixty percent. He was saying we have to drop them immediately and dramatically, you know, and instead we increase them. So the thing that will cause a change and it is causing some change and will cause more change is the climate impacts that we see will get people alarmed and want to do something as number one what this paper is saying is also informing the public about the potential risks that they're not aware of because we're just not looking at them that too will galvanize action it won't maybe not as much or whatever but it will got by saying, but by the way, do you realize that by you know, 2040, this could happen? Oh, my God. That, wait, that's I don't, you know, you know, I'll, I'll lose my farm. I'll lose my <laughs> house on the beach. I'll lose whatever. And, and and that will make people concerned to say, hey, Mr. Policymaker, Mr. President, Mr. Senator, whatever. What are you doing about that? I just heard that this might happen. Yeah, we heard that, too. Well, what are you doing? Well, we're not doing anything. What? You know, so that could help also. I think those two I things, think it's, everything else about like, uh, yes, we have to be better with our communications and figure that out. But it's all yeah. just gambling. All of it. It is. They are willing. So so there are yeah. more bullets being put in the chamber every day that we keep doing things as is. And more people are going to be um, on that. That It's getting passed around. And when it's going to go off, but no one thinks that it's going to go off. That It's um, your farm, your beach house, your whatever. Like the until the fire is at your doorstep and you have to decide all the things you're going to take with you until the floodwaters are washing your stupid car you know, away, you know, it's, it's like, it's not going to be you. It's not going to happen to you. And even what I'd love is if somebody would go back one year later to all those places that we have seen people running for their lives from the flames, from the flood, from the famine, from the war, whatever that happens because of our stupid pension mm -hmm. for fossil fuels. If they go one year later and they ask those people who were victims what have yeah. you changed? What have you done? Have well, you done? according if to, by the way, now that we have video, <laughs> I can show this here. This is, uh, don't even, uh, I'm gonna, uh, don't even think about it. Why our right. brains are wired to ignore climate change by George Marshall. In it, he did exactly that. He did just what you said. He went back to the Hurricane Sandy victims and wanted to talk about climate change with them and found out they are less likely to talk about climate change than the average person because They're they didn't want to talk about it. They want to focus on rebuilding. They don't want to talk about what caused it. Get out of here. You know, so that part doesn't actually work very well. Yeah, they they uh, want, want to pretend it's never going to happen again. Right. And just let, let me, you know, why are you talking about the bad stuff? I, I need to focus. I have to be positive now. I have to focus on rebuilding. I have to get back my life back together. And so going back to those people turns out doesn't, well, I mean, it could help sometimes, of course. But the bottom line is when there is discussion and everyone's talking about how that thing happened and it was climate, like in Australia, by the way. So Australia had a right wing, they put a car, they were forward thinking, put a carbon tax in. People said, oh, what the hell was that? And the, the right wing got in and got rid of the carbon tax. And then the fires and the droughts and the floods and the Armageddon <laughs> came and uh, and they knew it was climate change, and that seemed to be enough to get now a more progressive government in place that's taking steps to address climate change. So the impacts have a big impact. And this paper is saying not only will the that have a big impact, but talking about the future really bad things that can happen will help galvanize action. So uh, let's see, uh, Brian, I think you're on the top. So 
Yeah, so much of this has to do with plausible deniability, and it's a serious problem because our civilization has done perhaps too good a job of attributing blame for near-term causal kind of attribution, but far too poor a job of addressing the existential threats that government is theoretically supposed to uh, keep us away from. I would say that the uh, you know the the fossil industry has been practicing a different form of capture of greenhouse gas uh, situations. They're, they're capturing the greenhouse gas governments and the greenhouse gas intergovernmental panels. <laughs> and that form of regulatory capture is having a profound effect on meaningful moving of the ball in this decade of the 2020s, sadly. Okay. And then Eli, you had, oh, you had your hand up before Eli, but maybe not. Okay. No, that was a mistake. Sorry. Oh, okay. So um, let's, I turned off the thing. I'm checking the uh, comments on YouTube and things. I didn't see any particular ones. So uh, key research so far, <laughs> it's kind of funny in the paper, the two major pieces of research they, uh, they, first, they mentioned first were two popular science books, one, The Uninhabitable Earth, and the other one's called Our Final Warn Warning. But then they do talk about um, sort of scientific literature and uh there's already they talk about there's already an increased probability of multiple breadbasket failures. Talked about this a little bit earlier, causing a food price shock with higher temperatures. For the top four corn producing regions, accounting for 87% of corn production, the likelihood of production losses greater than 10% jumps from 7% annually under a two C scen uh, scenario to 86% under a four C scenario. Uh, and the IPC notes in its sixth assessment report that 50 to 75% of global population could be exposed to life-threatening climatic conditions by the end of the century due to extreme heat and humidity. So there are just like, you know, there, there is research showing that, you know, these really bad things could happen. Um, and they talk about how there's a lot of look at tipping points, for example, there's really not a lot of publications on the subject. And then the working group two IPCC uh, report had reasons, quote, reasons for concern. The five concerns are unique and threatened ecosystems, frequency and severity of extreme weather events, global distribution and balance of impacts, total economic and ecological impact, and irre irreversible large-scale abrupt transitions. I mean, it sounds... These are all like euphemisms for really bad things, but that's what the words they use. Each IPCC assessment found greater risks occurring at lowering increases in global temperatures. In other words, they they came out and said, here are five areas of concern, like tipping points and, and uh, um, you know, global impacts versus local impacts and uh, extreme weather. And at first they said, and all these things could happen if we hit three or four degrees, <laughs> Actually, they said uh, all five were listed for between 1.2 to 4.5 degrees. Uh, um, I'm sorry, all five was, was in contrast, only two were rated at ver as very high at this temperature interval in the previous assessment report. So at each later review comes, it says that these five things are a big risk at lower and lower temperatures. All five concerns are now high or very high for two to three C of warming. And again, we're gonna be at two C of warming in like 15 years and three C maybe, you know, another 10, 15 years after that, or, or depends on what we do, of course, but we're on track for three C by the end of the century for sure. And all of these five major areas of concern are high or very high where, uh, you know, just in previous reports they weren't. So the more we learn, the more we realize that these risks are very serious. So um, they then propose a sample research agenda. So the paper, again, is, is trying to say we should be studying this. And now they're going to talk about what should we uh, study? What should you know other researchers focus on? We suggest a research agenda for catastrophic climate change. Wait, let me just get back to, I'm seeing... Um, a little bit of the YouTube thing is a little distracting. We suggest a research agenda for catastrophic climate change that focuses on four key strands. One, understanding extreme 
climate change dynamics and impacts in the long term. Two, exploring climate triggered pathways to mass morbidity and mortality, basically killing lots of people. Three, investigating social fragility, vulnerabilities, risk cascades, and risk responses. So it's not just, you know, how many, how strong the storm is or what the sea level rise is. It's the social ability to respond to these stresses. And uh, certainly, so far, we've shown that we're not well suited for that, but uh, we, we, we need to study that. And four, synthesizing the research findings into an integrated catastrophe, into, into integrated catastrophe assessments. In other words, don't just look at one catastrophe that might happen with higher probability than we assume. But what happens if that happens and that what does it affect other risks and how do they all come together in risk cascades and things like that? So that anyway, there are there are large important aspects missing from these models that are highlighted in the research agenda. For longer term impacts under extreme climate change, pathways towards mass morbidity and mortality and the risk cascades and systemic risks that extreme climate impacts could trigger. That's what I just said. So they also say uh, uh, we need to look at extreme earth system states. We we need to understand potential long-term states of the earth system under extreme climate change. This means mapping different hothouse earth scenarios or other extreme scenarios, such as alternative circulation regimes. For example, what if the AMOC collapses? What happens then? That could happen in 20 years, you know, so we should understand that. And ir irreversible changes, <clears throat> excuse me, to ice cover and sea level. We have to look at mass morbidity and mortality. There are many potential contributors to climate-induced death, basically. But the four horsemen of the climate change endgame are likely to be famine and undernutrition, extreme weather events, conflict, and vector-borne diseases. These will be worsened by additional risks and impacts such as mortality from air pollution and sea level rise. So the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, in the climate change context are famine, extreme weather, conflict, you know, wars over you know diminishing resources, and vector-borne diseases. So, uh, you know, <laughs> pretty powerful statement there. And then they, we should look at three social... out of four match uh, perfectly. And social fragility, uh, we should look at vulnerabilities, risk cascades and risk responses. Societal risk cascades could involve conflict, disease, political change and economic crises. Climate change has a complicated relationship with conflict, including possibly as a risk factor, especially in areas with pre-existing ethnic conflict. Climate change could affect the spread and transmission of infectious diseases, as well as the expansions and severity of different zoonotic infections, creating conditions for novel outbreaks and infections. Hmm. What comes to mind? Epidemics can in turn trigger cascading impacts, as in the case of COVID-19. Exposure to ecological stress and natural disasters are key determinants for the cultural, quote, tightness, which means the strictness of rules, adherence to tradition, and severity of punishment of societies. So the social fabric, it unravels the social fabric. The literature on the median economic damage of climate change is profuse, but there is far less on financial tail risks, such as the possibility of a global financial crisis, which is kind of amazing when you think about it, because certainly climate change is gonna trigger something like that. Um, <clears throat> they said we should do an integrated ca catastrophic assessment Climate change will unfold in a world of changing ecosystems, geopolitics, and technology. Could we even see, quote, warm wars, unquote, technologically enhanced great power conflicts over dwindling carbon budgets, climate impacts, and SRM experiments? Interesting thought. Climate change could reinforce other interacting threats, such as rising inequality, demographic stresses, misinformation, new destructive weapons, and overshoot of other planetary boundaries. There are also natural shocks, such as solar flares and high-impact volcanic eruptions that present possible deadly synchronicity, synchronicities. Exploring this, these is a vital and a range of standardized catastrophic scenarios would facilitate assessment. Then they also recommend that there be an IPC special report on catastrophic climate change. 
The IPCC has yet to give focused attention to catastrophic climate change. 14 special reports have been published. None covered extreme or catastrophic climate change. A special report on tipping points was proposed for the seventh IPCC assessment cycle, and we suggest this could be broadened to consider all key aspects of catastrophic climate change. And then they conclude the paper with the following. There is ample evidence that climate change could become catastrophic. We could enter such end games at even modest levels of warming. Understanding extreme risk is important for robust decision making, from preparation to consideration of emergency responses. This requires exploring not just higher temperature scenarios, but also the potential for climate change impacts to contribute to systemic and risk and other cascades. We suggest that it is time to seriously scrutinize the best way to expand our research horizons to cover this field. The proposed climate endgame research agenda provides one way to navigate this understudied area. Facing a future of accelerating climate change while blind to worst case scenarios is naive risk management at best and fatally foolish at worst. So there you go. Um, by the way, before I forget, we're on YouTube now, so I have to tell everybody to please subscribe and hit the like button. That will help uh, uh, promote the, the episode to other people. <clears throat> and if you are on uh, Club Clubhouse, if you hop over to YouTube, you can still subscribe there. And of course, everybody on Zoom can do the same thing uh, later or or now. Um, so that's that's the paper. And I think I highlighted the key points. I think uh, just to summarize again for people maybe who joined late, the uh, what they're saying is that we're not looking at the most serious impacts. I mean, let's just talk about it now and then, but the focus is on what happens at one and a half and two degrees of warming. Yet, first of all, some really bad things could happen at that that we don't look at enough, but it certainly can happen. We can get to three and four and what happens then? And if we understood that better, we would, first of all, make better decision making. It would galvanize action. We could have better response planning and all these kind of things. So there's really a lot of positives come out of assessing these very serious possible outcomes. The negative side is it will scare people some more. But then again, they probably should be scared. So, you know, the benefits outweigh the risk, I think. I and mean, with that, any, anybody uh, with with like uh, just a grain of sanity and their wits about them, you know, who who digs into this stuff will, will you know, inevitably come to the conclusion, just like, yeah, let's not roll these dice, let's not run this experiment. Mm -hmm. And speaking of climate dice, that that that's an analogy that Jim Hansen came up with. I do want to say to everybody here who know that know this from last week that he's. Uh, uh, planning being our guest on December 17th, after he gets back from COP28, we'll have uh, climate scientist James Hansen on as our special guest. And um, he wants to talk about some stuff that I'm not even sure what it is yet. So that's kind of exciting. I, but uh, I think we'll at least briefly cover his pipeline paper and some other things. Um, and it's probably going to be a shorter, you know, probably going to be an hour, not not two or three hours. And so uh, we're going to have limited time for the, the audience questions. So we're going to have to figure out how to do that well. People well, have suggestions. Uh, this is this is my uh, birthday present. I'm guessing from you. Oh, you're December seventeenth. So, All right. There I'm you go. the twenty first. You know, which is not a Sunday. Oh, oh okay. So, yes, we'll celebrate or whatever. <laughs> Isn't that uh, the winter solstice? It is. It is the shortest day of the year. Um, one day I will be in the Southern Hemisphere and it will be lovely, but otherwise <laughs> I have to embrace the darkness. So you were born on the winter solstice. I was born on the Ides of March, which is a totally oh, different wow. thing. I was, yeah. I was actually born 2,000 years to the day after Caesar was killed. No way. Uh, and be, beware. 2,000 years to the day. At two Brute, beware the Ides <laughs> of March, right? That's uh, That's when he was killed. And yes. I, I was born on, on the Day of the Dead, so we're a really fun bunch. There we go. Oh Anybody gosh. else on stage uh, have an interesting birthday or whatever? Okay. The worst um, dark. That's great. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm opening it up for other comments and questions. Let me uh, pop over to uh, Clubhouse and see. Okay, I don't see any. 
particular questions there. And I'm going to go over to YouTube, by the way. Let's see. Um, I don't see. Yeah, it seems like there's no no new things there. Okay. So with that, um, again, want to remind you, uh, I don't know what the subject will be next week. I, again, I've been traveling to, to see my dad who's not well and stuff and 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 then so when i got back i had some extra work to do so i didn't really have time to line up uh, guest speakers gonna maybe try that for next week and then certainly for obviously for jim hansen and then we'll try to get more on uh, I, I think especially with i was also a little worried about bringing guests in without having the youtube platform solid i'm still not 100 percent sure of that i still need to do some more testing and different uh different tech uh, software to make it even better than it is using zoom as sort of an intermediate kind of thing. And I'm, I'm testing something called restream, but um, if we can get that all solid, I'll, I'll be, feel more confident about bringing guests on. We did do it with uh, Joe Rome. And um, anyway, so anyway, uh, with that, unless uh, Stacy, you have a comment or anyone else has any questions or comments, I think we should I, I try to actually... keep it shorter than, than you know, keep them shorter. And I think we'll get more yeah. people on on the, the replays if, if we have shorter. No, discussions. I was actually just tidying up my messy desk while I and I had my headphones on, so I, I could. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, but I if you want to test that, Dan, um, maybe we could pop on that. Um, yeah, I think we're going to try to do that and, uh, sometime this week here. Yeah. So with okay, that, so thank you everyone for coming. This is Climate Chat. I'm your host, Dan Miller. We talked today about the research paper titled Climate Endgame, Exploring Catastrophic Climate Change Scenarios. The link is in the comments on YouTube, as well as on Clubhouse. And uh, so you can look check out the paper yourself. And uh, thank you all for coming and look forward to seeing you next week. Again, if you're on YouTube, please uh, subscribe and like. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday. We, we do these every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific. We do a climate chat discussion. And so we hope to see you next time. Thanks, everybody, and bye-bye.